So there we go. So I will be sending out a link to everybody after the event and you'll be able to watch it again and you'll be able to share it with people who were not able to make it today as well. So let's get started. I'm super excited to introduce you to our uh, guest here today, our panelists. Um, first of all, we have Sean Gibson. Uh, Sean, Sean is from Tech Resources. Uh, he started working with fixed wing drones in 2013 while working for a Trimble vendor uh, in sales training and support services. Sean joined Tech Resources as a survey and engineering technician in 2017 at their line Creek Operations in British Columbia. There he began working with uh, Skycatch technology for his survey and mapping needs. And since then, the technology has been expanded across the tech organization. Sean's been instrumental in pushing the limits of the UAV and developing new solutions to suit the needs of mine. So welcome, Sean. We really appreciate and we're really looking forward to hearing your story today. You can wave right. and let people know. <laughs> uh, next, we have Tom Jennings. Tom started building and flying drones in 2012 as a safer and more affordable means to get airborne and to complement his work as a professional photographer and computer programmer. In 2014, he joined Skycatch and he honed his skills in photogrammetry and aerial surveying. He traveled throughout the US and trained pilots in collecting and collected data at industrial construction projects. In 2017, he shifted his focus to mining and has had his MSHA certification since then. Tom's our resident expert on all things high wall scanning and drones, and we're very fortunate to have him. Thanks, Tom. Thank and you. Our, our last panel speaker is Jeff Hanna. Jeff joined the product team at Skycatch in 2018. He initially worked with the Flight One team to design and implement the first iteration of high wall scanning. And since then, he's been expanded to the Edge One Intelligent Base Station, the Skycatch Vision Engine and now Data Hub, the web-based 3D analysis platform from Skycatch. Hey guys, glad to be here. Thanks, Jeff. So just so you know what we're gonna be talking about today, um, Sean will walk us through a brief discussion on the why and the what of high wall scanning. Um, in other words, how high wall data is used and what it is needed, especially um, in relation to uh, geo, geological and geotechnical perspective. We'll jump then into the different methods quickly and the pros and cons for capturing the data digitally. Um, Sean will share with us lessons learned from the field, um, as well as Tom for drone capture. And then we'll have a wrap up with the next generation of drone based high wall scanning that Jeff will review with us to show how the lessons that we've learned over the last year or so have been applied and automated in this next generation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sean and um, have him drive, drive this section. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so we'll start with the kind of the, the background of the, the why and what uh, with uh, high wall scanning and uh, basically how we got to where we are. So uh, how the data is basically used. Uh, there's two main kind of focuses, uh, geological being the first one. Um, so, you know, really high walls, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with them, but, you know, between bedding, faults, orientations of them all, um, fault kinematics, uh, it's, you know, persistence, the, the cross-cutting relationships, um, it's, it's really just, you know, what we're actually seeing on, uh, you know, many different scales out there to really understand uh, you know, geologically, what our mines look like, uh, you know, from a planning perspective, uh, and uh, you know, being able to move into the future, um, you can pretty much touch on just about everything with that. Um, and then the uh, the second component uh, is uh, really into the geotechnical side of things, um, where how all of this kind of comes to play from the positioning and orientation, um, and mainly, uh, I guess you know, for, for the stuff that really matters for making sure that we're keeping mines safe um, and uh, everything else that go along with, it goes along with that. So um, with high wall mapping, you know, the ability to map uh, large and small scale features, um, you know, if 
efficiently, effectively, and accurately is really important. Uh, but also, you know, as we progress through uh, the, the mine plan, um, how things are changing and developing uh, with hazards, trends, and uh, um, stuff basically as it comes at us. Uh, you know, you have a lot of data and a lot of information that's out there, but uh, this is another added layer of, uh, of help to be able to kind of take it to the next level. Um, and uh, it really makes a big difference uh, when we have these types of uh, applications and can and use these kind of data sets. Um, so, you know, really, what we've you've gone from a progression of using things like laser scanners and things like that for, for LiDAR clouds, but, uh, you know, a really important missing piece of it was uh, you know, the color and texture that exists in these types of scans uh, and specifically from a photogrammetry perspective it really makes a big difference um, for being able to uh, you know define and look at the different types of features and where they change um, uh, the the texture makes a huge difference in in being able to you know, accurately map and uh, uh, be able to actually interpret what we're getting out of the data sets that we're creating um, and as I mentioned previously, with you know small and large scale trends, um, yeah, it's it's important for it all to come together. So it really just takes it to the next level. So Jeff, maybe you can talk a little bit to the um, the different methods for digital capture. Yeah, absolutely. So if you saw in one of the pictures on the previous slides, the traditional method used to be done with a hand compass. Um, this was very manual. You had to be right up against the wall uh, in a dangerous location and the outputs of it were paper. Fortunately, we've moved on to some more advanced digital ways of capturing this data. And the two main are, are laser scanners and drones. Um, kind of looking at the advantages of both um, and the trade-offs, laser scanners do require a greater technical skill. Um, you have to set them up at the bottom of the pit, which is a dangerous location to be in, and you have to move them to various locations in order to scan the entire wall, which does take a lot of time. And anywhere that the laser scan doesn't have a good perspective, you can end up with holes or blank spots or shadows in your point cloud. Um, and then finally, they are very expensive to buy and to operate, um, and very time consuming to operate. Drones, on the other hand, have a lot of advantages, but in the past, uh, the meshes uh, weren't sufficient to be able to take these structural measurements that Sean mentioned in the last few slides. Um, in addition to that, the outputs that these workflows are normally done on, like 3D meshes, were not always properly geo-referenced and localized. They weren't placed correctly in your coordinate system. So you could use them for um, qualitative analysis, but you couldn't do them for these uh, structural measurements. And finally, to get the accuracy that we needed for this data with drones in the past, this required GCPs, which put us right back down in the bottom of the pit to lay these GCPs in unsafe locations, and they were very difficult to maintain. So fortunately, over the last few years, there have been a lot of major improvements that have um, kind of handled these uh, shortcomings of drones and given them a clear advantage over laser scans now. So the first of that is we no longer require GCPs to get very, very high accuracy with drones. Um, that keeps us out of these unsafe locations at the bottom of the pit, and we no longer have to maintain those GCPs. Uh, secondly, using drones like RTK solutions like Skycatch, it's much more accessible. You can fly from the top of the pit. The operator does not have to be at the bottom of the pit. And you can capture a much larger area that maybe was inaccessible with a laser scan before, either because it was unsafe to be at the bottom of the pit or there was no access to where you need to be to get the right vantage point on that pit. Um, and you could only scan the bottom bench, the active bench. So hopefully you captured the whole wall as it was dug out, but if you, if you missed something, you weren't able to capture it. With a drone, you have the accessibility of capturing the entire wall. Finally, um, it's more cost effective. It's uh, less expensive to purchase, to operate, and it's a very easily repeatable process. Okay, so um, thank you both for kind of setting the stage for our discussion today. Um, a little bit of the background to um, where we are now. Um, and Sean is gonna cover sort of his, I guess, trials throughout the last few months um, and what he's done to really dial it in to get the best results on it for tech. Yeah, so 
I mean, high walls present a really unique challenge uh, because of you know, how steep walls can be. Uh, so capturing the faces of this is, uh, is quite difficult, uh, especially as pits progress to get deeper and deeper. Uh, so with drones, with traditional and more com um, or uh, compared to um, standard Nader flights where you're just top down and you're flying at generally a consistent elevation, uh, it, it becomes a little bit um, more challenging to be able to capture that um, because you're trying to get high detail on something that uh, is dependent on flight height. Um, and so Nader flights tend to miss some of the data that's needed. Um, it it, it uh, involves a little bit more complexity to be able to you know, grab those faces. Um, so through testing and trying this out, before we had this high wall solution, uh, I would try different methods such as uh, flying uh, at different elevations uh, with different types of overlap uh, to try to you know, capture uh, data from two different levels and bring it all together. Um, it worked all right, but uh, it, you know, even by doing that, it didn't exactly uh, kind of hit the nail on the head with exactly what we were looking for. The results weren't there for some of the uh, geology and uh, geotechnical people to, I guess, uh, accurately, effectively uh, make good decisions based on the data sets that we were creating. Um, so the, the other problem was is that uh, Nader flights generally don't take into account things that uh, like overhangs, you end up with uh, you know, uh, data gaps here and there um, and extremely you know, vertical faces, uh, you know, they pretty much get, get missed. So you have these holes in the data and with, when you, know, you have a, an area that might be really, really important to adequately uh, capture. Um, and then the last, one of the last, uh, you know, Problems with it is you know the distance to the wall is really really important uh, with uh, with being able to capture this data. Um, so a Nader flight doesn't exactly uh, fit the bill on that too uh, if you're flying and trying to capture multiple elevations from uh, one flight height. Um, so really this this kind of um, spurred the need to be able to fly something and maintain a close distance to the wall, uh, be but be able to capture all of the benches uh, as you go through it. So where we started off was uh, for, for the idea of this was, you know, some manual flights with GCPs, um, which it works, it does a great job, uh, but, you know, to get it in the right spot and using GCPs, that's a lot of work. It's a, it's a lot of time going to places to lay out targets, um, survey them, uh, and, you know, then, you know, you've, you've spent so much of a day just trying to get that part done. Um, and you know, it's, it's not a very repeatable process um, to kind of do over and over again. Uh, so the, the next thing that I've tried is that I was noticing some of the behavior of how the Skycatch drones fly and what they would do is uh, as, they, as they'd hit the edges of lines, the drone would tend to bank um, as it was uh, kind of finishing its one line, uh, doing the, the edge of it and turn around and going the other way. Uh, the drone would uh, you know, tend to draw to, uh, take a few kind of side pictures. So you got a lot of overlap in some of these areas, kind of like within that last uh, photo from the last slide that I had there. Um, and it would capture a little bit, but it's not a reliable way to uh, capture uh, high wall data. It was you know, really circumstantial to what you were uh, potentially correct, um, collecting from the field. Um, and there's a very good chance you weren't gonna get everything. Uh, and throughout the whole process, uh, I would try things like double grids. So, you know, running parallel lines or, uh, or sorry, perpendicular lines to each other um, with everything I just mentioned before to just kind of overkill the data and see how well it would turn out. And things would be all right. Uh, you'd see you know, really nice results in one specific area, but the entire data set was not necessarily uh, up to what we were really looking forward uh, to, to trying to achieve in, in terms of something usable. So. Uh, so I then took this challenge to Skycatch and say, this is where we're falling short right now and I feel like we're almost there. Uh, so what Skycatch did is say, okay, you know what, we can, we can take this to the next level, we can make this happen. So we took the Nader camera uh, that uh, is normally flying with the drone and then added an oblique camera uh, to the gimbal attachment that exists on there as well. Uh, and through this, uh, Skycatch then developed an algorithm that would take the PPK corrections uh, from the regular Nader camera and incorporate it into the photos taken with the oblique camera uh, as well so that the data would turn out uh, spatially correct. Um, I can't comment completely on the, the PPK process with that. This might be something for Jeff or Tom. Um, I don't know if you wanted to mention anything right now or, or later about that. 
aspect? Or, yeah, I think uh, you nailed it. It's, it's, it's kind of how, how it uh, needed to come together. So uh, effectively, we were able to take as many or twice as many photos, but also capture the, the missing angles that uh, uh, didn't exist. So uh, the next piece of the puzzle was uh, being able to maintain that height, that um, distance from the wall and the consistent height, but also to be able to do it safely. Um, so what they did was they allowed us to incorporate a digital surface model uh, into the drone software um, in order to calculate the elevation changes that the drone was going to require to fly up and down the wall uh, and maintain that distance. Um, so because of this, uh, everything is, you know, has generally the same uh, kind of uh, uh, look and feel to the way the photos were going to turn out, um, and it would maintain that distance as it would, uh, climbed up and descended down the wall. Um, so after that, it uh, came down to kind of uh, testing the optimal settings for that environment with the distance from the wall, uh, the overlap, the gimbal changes uh, tailored to a specific scenario. Um, but there was a major advantage that came from this. It was uh, the repeatability and the accuracy. Um, wall mapping could now be done in pieces and then put together um, rather than, let's say, going after an entire wall uh, in one day knowing this is your window and it was going to take all day to do it. Uh, the ability to be able to do sections of walls and pieces because the accuracy is there uh, and then piece the puzzle back together, it seemed like a more reliable, um, confident workflow that I could achieve uh, in the course of the day, um, knowing that there's very seldom that I'm going to get three to six hours to go and spend on one task and one task alone. So now I'll talk about some of the capture goals and kind of what went into uh, the considerations for flights. Um, so obviously the distance from the wall is uh, kind of a big factor in how everything works. Uh, and it really depends on if you're trying to capture large or small areas, um, what you're trying to map and how much detail you need. Um, this is all dependent on the distance from the wall. Um, so further away, you can capture a much larger, larger area, but your detail is gonna be a little bit less. Uh, the closer you fly, you can map a smaller area with much higher detail. Um, but well, you can see on this there, Michelle. Sorry, um, I'm sorry. I, I did not mean to go that way. So there, there you go. go. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, where were we here? Uh, you can you can with a close to the wall, uh, you can capture you know much higher detail. Um, but it's going to be very battery intensive. You're going to be doing a lot of flights to kind of achieve that for the entire wall. So there is a happy medium to figure out. But like any drone flight, uh, it's you know really focused on what you're trying to achieve with your um, uh, data outputs. Um, so the next thing was, you know, really being comfortable with flying something, uh, you know, really close to uh, a high wall um, and where you're positioned and a lot of the things that kind of go into the safe operation of any drone activity, um, all really needed to be considered. Um, when you're flying, you know, 30 to 60 meters off a wall uh, and it's traveling up that wall, uh, it definitely can be a little bit deceiving if any, you know, for anybody who has watched a drone through the sky and it does seem like, you know, it is destined to crash, but in reality, it's nowhere near, uh, uh where that would even happen. Uh, it's the same thing with high wall mapping. So having a good vantage point and staying pretty close to a drone is really important for, for things like that, because it's not just at a cruise altitude at this point in time, it's constantly changing its altitude. Um, but that was, that's kind of the key with having that DSM brought into, the workflow as well too because you know you can kind of inspect the elevation changes that it was going to make throughout its flight and uh, you know being familiar with your data set before uh, you could make a really confident decision that you knew this was going to go properly. Um, the one big thing that I found too was that uh, contrary to traditional nadir flights uh, which you know if you want to create a better model generally side overlap is kind of the thing that gets you there uh, with these high wall mapping missions it's the front overlap that actually uh, makes a pretty good, uh, pretty big difference. I'll speak to that in, a, in another slide here. Um, but uh, it, it was an interesting one to see kind of how those react, especially when you're firing with two cameras. Um, another thing was uh, the lighting. Lighting with anything, obviously, in the photogrammetry space makes a big difference. But, uh, you know, sometimes waiting for the right window uh, was, wouldn't necessarily exist. Uh, when I did a lot of my testing, uh, it was kind of a rainier season, so I was getting good results, but they were a little bit dark and kind of 
wet looking. Um, but then when we, when I was able to test when we had really nice sunlight and everything was well illuminated, uh, the results got better and better. So um, that made a huge difference. Uh, Last and possibly uh, from a safety perspective, uh, calibration your, uh, of your compass and your IRMU, um, some of your safety checks uh, definitely worth mentioning. Uh, it's a, you know, there's a lot of changes going on with the, the flight plans and the, the way that the drone is going to be flying through this. So, you know, making sure your system is ready to go and do that confidently is always something you should be taking into consideration. And uh, when you're flying up and down walls, I think it's even uh, more important at this point. Uh, so now I'll go on to some of the considerations uh, with actual mission planning and how things really turned out. Uh, so the lower the flight height uh, and thus the distance from the wall, uh, it affects the overall um, number of flights, the number of photos taken, uh, as I mentioned previously. Um, so the lower and closer flights have a much higher resolution, um, but the overlap also uh, uh, it needs to be taken into consideration as well too if you are going to capture those angles that are required to build the model. Um, on the accuracy side of things, the SkyCatch system uh, is spec to be op optimal um, at about 60 meters um, of elevation. Um, most of my tests were in the 30 to 40 meters off the wall. Uh, that's where I was getting you know, the really, really good results to focus on. Uh, but that being said, when I have done it uh, flights at uh, above 60 meters, uh, I'm still very happy with the way that the results turn out from an accuracy uh, and results perspective, but it really all depends on the goal of what you're trying to achieve uh, from a data set. Um, so the next uh, bit was the overlap. Um, when you would crank up your front overlap, it would tend to uh, slow the, the drone down significantly, um, which also uh, made the drone uh, take more photos out of the nadir, uh, sorry, the uh, oblique camera as well. So, oh, hang on one sec here. I'm gonna be alright. I got a child who's trying to contribute too. <laughs> uh, if you just give me one sec here, guys. Sure. No, this is this is the life of uh, our reality today. Is uh, stay at home. We were just talking about this earlier. You're on mute. Okay. <laughs> Tom, is there anything you want to add to um, some of this since you worked very closely with Sean during this time? No, uh, he's doing a great job. Uh, you know, I think his point that he's trying to make here is that the front overlap uh, is preferable because it doesn't necessarily increase uh, the flight time required uh, the way the overlap, the side overlap does. Is that where you're going with that, Sean? Uh, a little bit, uh, you know, the front over or sorry, the, the front overlap was meaning that it was also going to take a lot more photos and especially for really close flight, uh, you were being able to kind of give it the data that it needed to uh, create the model, but the, you could decrease the side overlap um, quite a bit. Um, so you could spread your flights out and uh, get a little bit more, um, I guess, area covered uh, with that. Sorry, I've never been distracted in a Zoom meeting like that before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I hope that that makes sense. Uh, but we can revisit that or if there's any questions about that there. Um, and then uh, finally, the gimbal, uh, gimbal angle. Um, sorry, with, uh, because, you know, walls, this is all, this is something that's very subjective to the wall that you're trying to map and uh, uh, exactly what those angles are. So I would fly generally around 35 to 50 degrees with the gimbal. Um, it seemed to kind of give me the results that I was looking for, but uh, that doesn't say that doesn't mean that any other specific walls are going to do well based on that. So um, something to take into consideration uh, with uh, uh, with building the flight uh, and setting that uh, gimbal angle. Uh, so uh, lastly, your other considerations. Uh, this is a very battery intensive uh, job because it's constantly climbing and descending. So it's using a ton of juice to be able to cover, cover areas. Um, setting your first point close to a takeoff uh, at some of the lower elevations uh, means that it wouldn't necessarily use as much battery uh, as, uh, as it would have to if it was going to say climb to um, a higher point to start the flight. And then I would find too that if you knew that the battery was going to be on, um, you know, needed to be swapped out and it was going to end a flight line, if that flight line was going to be fairly high up on the wall, it was better to bring the drone down early so that when you return to where you left off, the drone didn't have to spend a whole bunch of battery just to get to where it left off. Um, and it made it a little bit more effective and uh, uh, quicker in that sense. So 
Um, and so, yeah, finally, here's a couple of the results. Can't uh, show everything that I've done to be here all day. Um, so the left is kind of a, a smaller area. Uh, it uh, was flown fairly close to the wall, um, but the results were uh, phenomenal. And then the right hand section was uh, uh, done of like the entire wall. Um, so from much further away, um, and uh, then kind of all put together. Uh, the, uh, the left data set too, that would be one of the ones that uh, I would have pieced everything completely together uh, from flying the wall on multiple different missions there. So, sorry, I've got a little guy into the pots. You know and what, I think everybody understands. <laughs> do, not, do not worry at all. I'm gonna make Tom the host for a moment. He's gonna bring this up, um, bring up one of these high walls on, uh, I don't know if it's live, but in the uh, in the Skycatch system. Tom, do you have the host now? Yeah. Can you all can you see the uh, this is the overview of one of the larger walls that Sean had done? Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, great, great. Um, and then what we can do is we can zoom in and really see the detail in some of this. Uh, and what's really exciting about the technology though is that the, the what we're looking at here is really is a three-dimensional mesh. The actual point cloud and uh, deliverables that you would be able to download are even higher resolution than this and, and really paint an excellent picture of the geology of these pits. Awesome. We have a question from Brett. Um, is the rule still line of sight for the drones? Yes, it's always visual line of sight. Um, it, you know, personally, I've found that actually flying from the top of the pits can sometimes afford the best vantage. Flying from the bottom, you, you have the, uh, always have the pit wall right behind the drone and it can make it very difficult to judge the, uh, the depth that you're looking at. Another question, has there been any benchmarking studies done relative to speed and efficiency? We haven't really done any uh, tests of speed and efficiency. You know, we, we, our real goal here is quality of data. So, you know, we, we definitely sacrifice speed uh, somewhat to develop the highest resolution model possible. Um, we are exploring other avenues, though. Right now, we fly uh, up and down the wall. Uh, some of the other things we're thinking about looking into is uh, parallel to the wall along the benches, which, which uh, I think could be more efficient as well. Another question, how detailed should the DSM for the flight surface be? That's a great question. Uh, it's actually, what we've found is that the, DSM can be very low resolution. We actually subsamples our, our DSMs down to uh, a point every five meters, which is enough to uh, maintain that uh, distance from the wall, uh, but also uh, do very good terrain following. Awesome. And um, one more right now for, this is probably more for Sean. On this particular mesh, how many batteries would that have taken to complete in general? Or uh, that was it? a two or three battery flight uh, for that one there. Um, I, want, I want to say three on that one. Um, I don't have the exact dimensions of roughly how much it covered, uh, but to do that entire wall, I think I did uh, kind of four different sets of missions over uh, three days. Uh, just with the amount of time that I had to, to be able to spend on there. And I wouldn't be on the wall in that area for more than an hour uh, to capture that bit. That was the time that I had allotted. Um, and then, yeah, about, uh, about a uh, uh, two or three battery mission on that. And then one more question. Can you load a 2D ortho photo background map to assist with flight planning polygons to complement the DSM model? Yes, and that, that's a great question. Uh, it's a really great feature. You know, a lot of times the satellite imagery in these apps that's used as a background is is either out of date or you've made some recent, you know, major changes to the train. That's what's happening on these mines. So really important that you have up to date imagery as a background to have good textual or good context um, for your mission planning. So we do allow you to load 
uh, a base map in, and this can be any base map from any data set you've processed on Sky Catch Cloud. Awesome, some really good questions there. Um, let's go ahead and if there aren't any other questions at the moment, we'll, um, if you wanna let me yeah, share I'll hand my it back screen. To Michelle. Yeah, thanks Tom. There you go. And we'll go back to this. And Jeff is gonna talk about, um, well, first of all, Sean, awesome. Thank you. And I, we appreciate you doing this while you have to take care of your child at the same time. And we know how hard <laughs> that can be. So awesome job. He just job. wanted to be a part of it, I think so. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> he's, he's, he's a future drone enthusiast. Um, yeah, we just so, don't understand what he's saying. <laughs> so now Jeff is gonna talk a little bit about how a lot of the things that we've learned in um, in all of this um, has helped um, us apply and automate um, our next generation of high wall scanning that's drone based. So I'll let Jeff take it away. Yeah, so clearly a lot of lessons learned over the years and through hundreds of flights and uh, I've had the privilege of working with our amazing partners like Sean to learn about, you know, what's working well, what's not the areas for opportunity or the areas for improvement. Um, and then get to implement some of that. So before I jump into the improvements, I wanted to give everyone just a, a brief overview of our system if you're not familiar. Um, we offer an end-to-end -end solution. That means we have technology serving the capture workflows, processing, and the data analysis. On the capture side, we have our own drone, which is a modified M100 called the Explore One. Um, some great advantages to this drone built based on the customizations we've added. We also work with standard off-the-shelf DJI drones, such as the P4RTK and the M210RTK. Um, also on the capture side, we have our own mission planner called Flight One, and a GNSS base station called the Edge One, which helps these drones uh, perform their RTK and PPK workflows. On the processing side, this Edge One base station also serves as an in-field processor to get results in the field before you even uh, pack up the drone. And then we can also process on-premise with what's called SVL or in the cloud. Our data analysis platform is called Data Hub. So the advantage of having an end-to-end -end solution like this is it allows us to innovate on any part of the stack in order to create new solutions or improve the solutions we have like we've done with high wall scanning. So next I wanna jump into how we, we were able to improve based on the feedback Sean gave. So the first one, you know, Sean mentioned uh, getting that gimbal angle right was very important. And it's, it's difficult to hone this in. It's different for every wall. And it may, there may not even be one magic number for an entire wall, right? These walls change angles. So the first thing we did um, in the improvements to Flight 1 is in 4.0, the gimbal angle will actually change in real time dynamically during the mission so that it's always facing the right angle to the, towards the wall. You know, Sean made a lot of good points around overlap. So in general, uh, these drones fire as, the cameras fire as fast as they can. Um, that's so that the, the uh, mission efficiency can, can be as high as possible. You wanna finish these missions as quickly as possible. So the drones uh, actually have to slow down for those cameras in order to achieve the right overlap. And typically how this calculation is performed is by assuming that the uh, cameras facing perfectly downward, which is not true anymore for these high wall scanning missions, and then the terrain below the drone is flat. And again, that's not true. Um, so what we've done in flight one is uh, we've updated these calculations to consider all the factors, to consider the gimbal angle that's live changing during the mission, the distance from the wall, the shape of the terrain, and then of course the ascent and descent speed, right? It takes some time to climb up and down the wall. All of those are factored in. The results are you get the perfect amount of overlap based on your mission settings under any conditions, any terrain changes, uh, any steepness of a wall. So those are the improvements we made onto the capture side. We wanted to make sure we were giving our processing stack the best possible inputs it could have to get the best outputs. Um, on the processing side, so going back to kind of how this data is used, right? We're doing these um, very precise structural measurements. And in order to get the right results out of those measurements, our 3D data needs to very closely approximate the shape of the surface. Now, we always want our drone outputs to be high quality and high accuracy, but what does that mean for something like a 3D mesh? 
So for quality, we need high uh, visual quality. That means high texture resolution, the right colors. And for accuracy, we're no longer just talking about accuracy of a single checkpoint. We need accuracy of the entire surface so that when we get those orientations out of those features, that those give us the right results. In order to closely approximate the shape of these complex structures on the wall, that means we need hundreds of millions of very tiny triangles. And that wasn't really possible on any of the processing software out there today. So we made improvements to our stack and now we're able to support hundreds of millions of triangles for very large scale captures up to 5,000 photos for a single high wall capture, which is probably more than you ever need to do at once. Uh, next, so this, these processing jobs, even after all these improvements, they were very, very intensive jobs. So the next thing we needed to do was to deploy this processing software to very, very powerful hardware. So of course you can always upload to our SkyCatch cloud to process, but we have a new solution as well called the SkyCatch Vision License. So that allows you to take our processing software and run it on a very powerful on-premise machine. This is a perfect solution for minds that don't, don't necessarily have the best internet connection to be able to upload those, um, all those raw photos or download the outputs afterwards. So this is a solution that will work anywhere, even offline. Great, thank you everybody for, um... For, particip well, for participating in the presentation. Um, we'll take any additional questions that anybody might have. Um, one of the ones that was asked was, um, what is the relationship, Sean, with your geotech and uh, geologist? Um, how, do you, how closely do you work together as you're doing this? Um, and how, how involved are they when you're capturing information? Um, they're a fairly closely related team. Uh, they do kind of have their own silos of, of responsibilities and things, things they're looking to take care of. Um, but essentially, a lot of them will be using the same data sets just for different purposes. Uh, in, at this point in time, a lot of the uh, requests that come in have basically just been like, hey, can you fly this high wall and what's the best you can do? And then, uh, you know, created a product and given it to them and waited for the feedback and uh, when we first started releasing some of it uh, it was they were pretty blown away by it it was like the holy smokes this is like a data set we've never seen before um, it was almost overwhelming uh, just because it was uh, so crazy to be able to uh, map that much and I was able to turn around as quickly as possible so um, I hope that answers your question and I think this is one for Jeff, probably. Can your data be imported into LeapFrog or ArcGIS? Yeah, um, it's pretty standard outputs that we generate. Um, OBJ for the mesh, um, LAS or TXT point clouds, um, all can very easily be imported into um, LeapFrog and all your standard uh, high wall analysis programs. Uh, Dylan asks, do you ever use ground control points with the RTK data or PPK data? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on your accuracy requirements. We typically find that that's not necessary, especially for the, the high wall captures, but there are always use cases where people are looking for um, best possible accuracy, um, even if it complicates the workflow and, and they're willing to do the extra step. So yes, there are some cases where we do a combination of uh, RTK, PPK, or uh, and GCPs. Um, not sure. Integrating any core to high wall geological signature analysis. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. I guess okay. uh, maybe we'll, we can move we'll, on and we can yeah. get some clarification. We'll, we'll follow up on that one. Uh, Nathan, we'll follow up with you on that one. Uh, Chris Lane made a comment. Some of the comments I had for Sean, I guess maybe you guys work together, were it's better than being in the pit looking at the geology. So he must be a geologist. <laughs> so thank you for that, Chris. Um, is, is Sorry that something to chase the little guy around, but yeah, Chris is one of our senior geologists. Uh, so he's definitely one of the guys who we... Uh, you know, fire the data out right away. So um, it was uh, pretty awesome. Guys like him uh, are pretty, uh, they, they're pretty strict with what they're looking to, to see. So it was good to impress a guy like Chris. Awesome. Okay, I, uh, let's see. I think I have a couple more questions. Um, 
Is there a plan to develop with the M300 and survey payloads? That's a question for Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're close partners with DJI. Um, we actually assisted them in their development of their first RTK drone. Um, and, you know, we're always looking to uh, integrate with the latest and greatest drone. So I think uh, we will see something coming. And I think the last question for the session, unless another one comes in, can you, can you use just the new flight one for mission planning or does the processing software come as one package? Uh, yeah, right, right now it's, it's a package. There is some flexibility in, in what solution you're looking for, depending on your needs. So um, we, we have uh, two main packages, one that's uh, kind of uh, software based for processing flight automation, another one that includes um, or that comes with hardware. So, uh, but for now, yes, it is, it is included with processing. Oh, and I do have one more question. And Tom, this is a good one for you. Where does the DSM source data typically come from? Laser scan, question mark? Typically what we do is we fly the site at a very high elevation and process the DSM in our, in our cloud uh, solution, which makes it very easy to obtain. Uh, you know, if it is possible to use LiDAR data or other sources though, uh, I've even used satellite data uh, if the pit hasn't changed dramatically uh, in recently. Awesome. How long does it take to process the data and create a 3D mesh once you capture the data? Um, it depends on, on the hardware, right? It, it depends on if you're processing in the cloud or if you're using SVL to process on your own machine, that obviously depends on the hardware there. Um, and other things like the uh, area that you capture, the altitude, but um, our processing solution is optimized for speed. We definitely think it's one of the fastest options out there and uh, you can get turnaround as quick as a day for very, very large data sets. And I have one more here. Has there been any development in battery technology to be able to do longer flights? I know battery tech and automotive has developed significantly in recent years. Tom, you haven't put on the flight battery? Uh, have it's seen definitely it improving. The, the M300 is going to have a 55 minute flight time. Uh, so DJI is making strides to improve flight times and battery performance. In the meantime, we try to make it as easy as possible to do a battery swap. The drone comes back automatically, lands, you swap the battery, and it resumes the mission right where it left off. And I found that pretty useful to be able to, to have that ability. Uh, it, it gave me kind of a, a data set and an area of capture that uh, was effective um, and it was fairly easy to do. Um, and then what, would, what I would tend to do is that if I would capture, you know, some of the, I did a few missions that were in like the five, six battery ranges. Uh, and I mean, I'll process them all together uh, as one. It does take quite a while, uh, but you know, processing in pieces is definitely uh, an option that uh, explored. Uh, mainly because your accuracy is there with the with the data, so everything will line up uh, really nicely. So I wasn't worried about how that would turn out uh, in that sense. So sometimes I would process it in pieces, and then other times I would do the whole thing uh, all together or both. And to the accuracy question, someone asked, um, when you're validating the SkyCatch data set, what is the best methods you use, and any, and what are the typical accuracies X, Y, and Z? Uh, typical accuracy you can expect is under five centimeters easily with uh, one GSD. So one GSD depends on the camera. On the M210, that's 60 meters. Um, and at two GSD, so on the M210 or Explore One, that's 120 meters, you can expect under 10 centimeters. And, and you know, that's um, generous. I, I think we typically do better than that. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our questions here. Um, Obviously, if anybody has any further questions, feel free to reach out um, and you can reach us at, you know, on our website at skycatch.com or um, through our email mining at skycatch.com. Again, I appreciate all of our panelists for being here. Some really good questions today, really good answers today, really good information. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Nice work. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, guys.